Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Bobby Mo Football Show. I'm your friendly neighborhood, Sam Anthony. Joining me today friendly is Luke Yos and Michael Shuley. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back. I don't think you liked that friendly neighborhood. Comment. It was weird. It was just the way you, way you said it was really like... I looked I right know. at you when yeah. I said it, which was really funny. I, I, I didn't have a creative uh, introduction tag for myself. I don't think I... No, I, 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 I didn't think I was... I think you were going I mean, better way. than last time. Last time we made fun of Greg, so... That's okay. I mean, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah it's Greg. So, Bobby Mo Football Show, guys. A lot to talk about here. We're going to start off with the kickoff. First things first is that last week's game, Robert Morris falling to the Duquesne Dukes, 48-24. It was a game that was really close in the first quarter and not really close the rest of the game. Yeah. It was 7-7 seven seven in the first quarter, so yeah, you can say it's close. So guys, looking at this loss, who's to blame? For me, um, I would say it, it kind of was in stages. So the offense was clicking that first drive. And then I can't remember which possession it was later in the game, but there was that fumble off a catch by uh, Warren Robinson. Warren Robinson, thank you. Um, and that's really where the offense just kind of shut down. That was the end. It was well, not necessarily like the, but like it, it's it stalled from there on out. It was it would be there'd be flashes of, but it it wouldn't it wasn't the same. I mean, they still scored. I mean, seventeen in the rest of the game. It wasn't like it stalled completely. Yeah, but I'm saying it wasn't. It there that first drive they moved the ball down the field and they moved 96 it ninety six well. yards. Yeah. yeah, it was phenomenal. And then after that fumble, after that, after they lost the ball there, it wasn't quite the same. the The wind was out of the sails, if you will. Um, but for me, I it's just been a defensive struggle. I mean, that's putting that's, it lightly. Yeah, that's all it is. Is like the defense just needs to like. I don't know what needs to happen with the defense. I, I'm at a loss for words. I'm going to tell you right now. Everything. I yeah, think, I mean, Mike, I think you'd agree with me. I mean, 49 points per game allowed. You're talking about... Where does that rank like, over in like the FCS? Like Where does it rank uh, in general? It's like bottom 10. In yeah, the I know. They're, like, they're, they're, they're horrible, to put it nicely. Um, I'm yeah, that is putting it now, nicely. I think they only have one game where they gave up less than 500 yards of total offense. Off and the they average 552.2 yards per game. Yeah, I, that that is like, I it's don't bad. know. That's that, like that's, that's, that's video like, game that's play like if you're playing yeah. Madden on like rookie or pro, and your offense is putting those type <laughs> of numbers up a game, and you're undefeated for the whole seat. But like that, I I didn't get to see the Duquesne game. This was the uh, first game of the season that I really didn't catch any of. I caught part of the Bryant game, but other than that, I caught. Well, I didn't catch any, much I don't of the even James. Know why we bring you on the show? I didn't anymore, catch much of the honestly. James Madison game. Sorry, I was in Philadelphia getting disappointed, but um, that could be so a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, that was very. <laughs> we lost. Let's just put it that way. We we caught a big L. But you um, not do good at all this week. <laughs> it was a rough weekend. It was a lot of L's. <laughs> a lot of L's. But um, yeah, it, looking at the box score again in. Hold on, I have the, that's the wrong box. There we go. Allowing 29 first downs, 321 rushing d- yards. They they won the passing game. I think I might have said last week was that Jimmy Walker is going to be his first 300-yard passing game. Yep. He came close to 267, but then he had the turnovers, the two interceptions, but which were if huge. You, if you look at those two turnovers, neither of those were Jimmy Walker's fault. They were off deflections. It was kind of, and I mean, one of them was not only a Got deflection, tip of the line, but and it the was guy like, caught it on the other side. Like, yeah, I mean, it was literally like just bang, bang that. play where it was like literally right place, right time. I don't blame Jimmy Walker for either of those two turnovers. I thought Jimmy Walker played great. Um, I mean, he did a great job of getting to his he two most consistent sacked. guys. How many times did he get sacked, too? He got sacked um, a bunch. But hold on. Hold on, Yos. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Kickoffs turns total. Er, here we go. Where is the defense? Yeah, you know, we don't got all day, man. We do what not have all day. As soon as I find that, I'll keep looking for it. I, I will right, share it with all you. Right. <laughs> but, oh, man, you just got me sidetracked. Where were we? The passing defense wasn't that bad, but... It's probably not that bad when you're just getting torched on the run every play. 6.7 yards a carry, five rushing touchdowns. They had a positive gain of 350 yards. So and they lost 29 of them, but wow, that is bad. 48 attempts. They just got – they're getting beat, like, up front. It's just 
They're at the mercy of the other team. How often do you want to run the ball? They're getting a first down every other play with that tells me through the pat through the on the ground, which the defense is never getting on the field, getting off the field at that rate. Um, I'm looking here to see if I can find conversion rates for this game. Third down conversions. This might have been their best game of the year. Actually, they held on to five of eleven on third downs. That's a going off the top of my head. That's that below might, average. That that is below average for the Colonials. <laughs> um, so once again, just. No mercy from the other teams, obviously, just running it down their throats. And but do you blame them? Oh, do you like all like? 100%. Well, once again, it's one of those things where if it's ain't broke, don't fix yeah, it. I mean, Robert Morris <laughs> hasn't proven that they can actually stop the run. And I mean, I was watching the um, Central Connecticut Robert Morris game, and Chris Shovlin described um, one of the gaps that the running back ran in for a touchdown as one that was like seismic in nature how how large it was Could've it drove was, a semi truck through that it. was actually the correct term that he yeah. used he was like there you was can literally drive a semi truck <sighs> through it i think i might have said that on color commentary for that game as well because some of the i don't know if it's their gap discipline or what like i said i didn't see this duquesne game was there a lot of misdirection a lot of counter run no, plays or were they just them. running power power left out. power right up yeah. the middle so something interesting to point out was that there were two notable players that did not start the game. Now, they did make their way into the game, and those two players were Tuval Brown and Adam Wallet. And Adam Wallet, to me, is the most interesting in the sense that he is their leading tackler. And the only reason I could think of him not starting that game was, one, and this is what Clark said at practice, was he was battling a little bit of an injury. But theoretically, the other way you could look at this, and again, I'm just... This is all hypothetical. I'm not saying for sure, but... Um, it, have we ever thought that potentially it was because even though he's getting high amounts of tackles, it's because he's leaving the gaps open or he's pursuing over pursuing where he shouldn't be pursuing. Um, I think that that's been a big issue. I think you're seeing these guys and everyone going towards the ball carry, which is great, but gaps are being left open and edges are not being sealed. That's the biggest problem is it doesn't matter whether they run it up the middle, whether they run it left or right. It, I mean, they're not going to tackle when they're You're well, talking about, well, you know, Six, seven yards per carry. I'm yeah. going to use a uh, team euphemism here. And they say okay. all gas, no brakes. But sometimes you need to pump the brakes around a little bit and have some discipline. Uh, I remember in that CCSU game, I want to say it was the first touchdown CCSU scored on that first drive. They ran that counter out of the shotgun, I want to say. And the whole defense just over-pursued He cut back and had could have drove two semi trucks down the side of the field where he was there was no one there and no one on that defense has enough speed to get over sideline to sideline and uh make that and tackle chase down somebody yeah and the whole the holes are just massive they're getting they're getting bullied up front which is something that coming into the season we didn't think was going to happen especially when you have all nec last year in uh amir fenwick and then nec all nec preseason again again and I've heard his name hardly at all this yeah, year in any sort of positive light. In, in anybody's play call or anybody's yeah. stat line. So my next question to you gentlemen is looking at this season in general and the way this is the problems that Robert Morris has been having, specifically on the defensive end because those are the most glaring, is there an immediate solution to these problems? No. I don't think so. I have enough faith in the coaching staff and enough, like, I want. Uh, I say I'm gonna go with excitement in this coaching staff. I think this this staff is legit. The people that are in place are legit for the most part, especially higher ups. I think. I think if Clark brought Plungus in, and the offense has been great, so that that's you're they're doing great over there. But I think if Clark has stuck has puts this much faith in Plungus and Clark himself, a defensive guy, you know. I think they would have been able to figure out something. For them to be this bad is just, it's kind of mind-boggling. And now, granted, I want to say last year, someone had told me, given me a stat, that they lost five of their top seven tacklers from last season, some something like that, which is a lot. But, and, that, and that's one of the, and that's, that's one of the, the but, and that's the problem with this team, Yost, is that, the tackling has been such a problem. Tackling and discipline has been such a problem. And making tackles when you're out of position is difficult because if you're going to have to run all the way across the field at someone, yeah. they can easily cut back and break that tackle. And it's harder to stop when it, stop all your momentum going that way and make that play. But if you're sitting in the gap waiting for the guy and there's no hole for him to run through, he's going to run right into your arms. Yeah, you know? so 
And I want to add on to your point because you mentioned five of the top seven. So I'm going to run down the list of top tacklers from last year. Do it. So number one is Adam Wallet, yeah. still here. Um, 108 tackles. Well, Next. He, well, he left the game early. And he got that targeting call. Yeah, which, you know, again, that, questionable that's call, but it's one of those things that y- – It happens, yeah. exactly. And, and the referees are doing the, their job to make sure and the what if that's safe. And what if that's not a targeting call? Let's say it's an injury or something. Yeah. It's still one of those things that, all right, you lose your top tackler. You still have to overcome that. And there's yeah. and, and that's a natural wh- part What was game. that targeting call? It was second quarter. There's your turn. That could quite possibly – was it early in the second quarter? Because they gave up, yeah. what, 24 in the second quarter? And that's the difference in your ball game right there. Personally, I don't think – because considering he didn't start the beginning of that game and their defense looked solid on that first drive, which is where they forced the fumble. Um, they are making good tackles. Um, I mean, one of the reasons they forced that fumble was because they were, weren't letting up the big play. So it was a grind for Duquesne, and then Duquesne had the fumble. And that's where Robert Morse did it. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's easy, to, easy to look at one player. But again, going back to this bigger picture here, Gerald Ferguson was the next leading tackler. He's gone. Joe Uatafi, gone. Ryan Richards, gone. Drew Allen, gone. Tyler Lamica, still here. Zach Samiska, gone. May I ask um, what positions the bulk of these guys played? So Ferguson and Utafi are linebackers. And then Richards and Allen are corners, or sorry, defensive backs. And Zamiska is a D lineman. So you got so, people from all over. So you lost three guys out of your front seven there. Yes. Yeah. That's huge. That's big. That's. Because that's the anchor. That's the anchor good good defense. Too. Ferguson was quick. Ferguson had eight and a half sacks, which led the team. Um, Adam Wallet, as much as he was leading tackler, did not record a single sack last well, year. Well, I mean, that's a different position. Because were, were they playing a? Th- did they change to a three-four this year? Yes. So, and that could be another thing. Maybe Fenwick is built instead of a three-technique defensive tackle because he plays on the interior of that yeah. line, right? Yeah. Maybe he's not built to be doubled up, and maybe that it is beneficial for him to play in a four-three system. Yeah. It's, and I'm going to revert back to the point where I said earlier where I have faith in this coaching staff, and I think over time it's going to get better. Well, because you're, you're going to bring guys through your yes, system. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I'm not saying this first year is always kind of a toss up because he doesn't Clark doesn't have his guys in there. Yeah. But what they've been able to do with this offense, Elijah Jackson, although he wasn't brought in by Clark, Mike Miller, Mike, yes, former offensive coordinator. Um, you want to mention he's, that? He's hopefully for the Colonials going to be there for the next. For the remainder of his career, yeah. hopefully he doesn't transfer somewhere, or God forbid he gets hurt or something tragic like that. Uh, Stevens, who's is Stevens a junior? S- he's a junior, so he got one more year left to him. Uh, then your receiving core, redshirt uh, freshman in Vecchio, or I'm sorry, Del Femini, um, junior in Vecchio, who had a terrible game against Duquesne, two receptions for three We're yards. We're going to talk more abysmal. about that later. We'll get back to him later. Um, you have arguably Gonzo's what one of the best tight ends, not just in the conference, in the but nation. arguably in yeah. all of FCS football. In terms of receiving. And he's going to be back next year. Um, Patrick, I believe, is a redshirt sophomore, I want to say. Who is this? Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, he's yeah. a redshirt sophomore. He's so he, he got a couple more years, and I'm really excited to see him because if he could get his hands better, I think one of the things that with him is he they don't have as much confidence in him as catching the ball. Yeah. But he's still young in his well, career. Well, here's the thing about Patrick. If and he's huge. A, if you go to Robert Moore's football practice, Patrick almost always stays late. He did it yes. a lot in during camp, working on catching. He's a guy that is determined. He has the work ethic to go and get better and learn something like that. And he has the size. He's an athlete. He's big. So he's as so soon as big. he starts doing that, and you've seen flashes of it, yeah. when he gets in the open field because he he's so he big, he's hard to bring field, down. You just gotta Throw it to him. Like I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to step in front of him. No, th- there's not a there's not a defensive back that by themselves is going to bring Steve Petrick down. Yeah. Oh no! And the thing is, yes, they're going to lose Jimmy Walker, who's an experienced quarterback, a good quarterback. Uh, but George, but Martin, George Martin, Martin has looked sharp. George Martin's going to be good. Yeah. I think. He, I, think I think he's going to be. I think he's. Here. I think he's the future in the quarterback position. Unless you never know, they bring they might grab a guy that they really like, fall in love with. Um, you still have Caleb Lewis, who's looked okay he's still his first year in the system you never i Lewis, think that'll be an interesting is Lewis, is Lewis a senior too yeah is Lewis, they're yeah. both so they're yeah, both Lewis senior. A graduate senior. i thought lewis was a junior pardon me on that um so i think without changing the quarterback position i think it's a system that benefits the quarterback as well because the focus in the premise is on the running game and the offensive line i believe is going to be there for one more year the the main core of that line at least um so that's something to be excited about Going to the future is their ability. I think the offense is set. If they bring in a couple good players on defense, you know, 
I think if they shore up that front seven, I think is Fenwick gone after this year? No. So that's huge. I think he's gonna. I think he could have a huge bounce back year next year. Wallet will be gone though, right? Ah, uh, yeah, Wallet will be gone. So that's that's gonna be that's gonna be a huge loss in the middle of that defense. You got to find people find people that can replace or have people that can step up and fulfill those roles. Yeah. So, and and, and that's something that's definitely you know to keep an eye on in the future. But going back to currently in this season for Robert Morris. You're sitting at 0 3 in conference. Realistically, you know, best case scenario here is you win out and you go six and five, but then you know you can still only win what three games in conference. So you can finish three yeah. and three at a 500 level. So if you're Robert Morris right now, the idea of winning a conference is pretty much out the Go window. On. Yeah. Um. Just the just the way it is. You, when you're 0 and three, you just you can't do it. So, is there still something to this season that's salvageable? Um. Other than like a three and three in con, I think if they finish three and three in conference, that's respectable. I like for a first for like a yeah. new coach with a a whole new system and an old team. I think that's a, a respectable considering th- what team you got. Yeah, well, yeah, you got the cards that were dealt with him were not favorable in the best in any sort of form or fashion. But they have an opportunity. If you can go back to that that statue here, there you go. Uh, they have an opportunity to play spoiler to Sacred Heart, who's like a contender. For a conference title, not just year. a contender, probably the favorite yeah. right now. In the and way they can catch him. They might be able to catch Sacred Heart, and they, if they c- they could play spoiler to Sacred Heart, which would be big. That would be if they beat Sacred Heart. I think that would be a big like it's a statement. Yeah, it's a statement win. And for me, yeah, the record's not gonna be what you want it to be at the end of the year. It's, I mean, that's just the plain and simple of it. But if you can get that one statement win these last handful of games i think that's going to be big moving on that's my thought well yost looking at the remainder of the schedule here central state this week should be a win should Um, be should Should be be. should be i think i think i think they're going to pull it out here central state's offense has been anemic so far this season thought about duquesne's too but they're also a division two team and yeah, they that ha- is, they, that's, that's, like that's three level. and four, one and three in their conference. How are they, how are they running the Their ball? last game, they beat the University of North Carolina Pembroke. Pembroke. Pembroke? Pembroke. Yeah. Pembroke. 44 to 38. So that's by far their highest scoring total of the season. They have a 7 nothing win, a 24 to 6 win. Uh, they're scoring significantly less than, in most of their games, less than 30 points a game. Um, so I don't think the offensive threat is going to be there. That'll be a good test of the defense because if the defense can't stop this team, yikes! yikes. So nice one. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so I'm going to chuck up a win against Central State. St. Francis, good defense, very good defense. In fact, you can argue one of the best or the be- probably the best in the conference for St. Francis. That'll be a good test of the offense. As for the defense for St. Francis. One of the best offenses. So if I go back here to the good old standings, St. Francis though, two and four, zero oh and one in the conference. Maybe they could pull out a win there. Maybe we'll see. I don't think they're going to beat Sacred Heart. I think it, they could play. They could play spoiler. I just, I just don't think it's going to yeah, happen. The, the cards are stacked. Very much in Sacred Heart. I'm favorite. still I'm still dead set that they're gonna lose to Eastern Kentucky. And I think Wagner's that, that kind of like a toss up game. You gotta win one game in the conference. And I think Wagner's gonna be that and one game in Wagner's the conference. Wagner's gonna be, but win. best case scenario, like we were talking about, yes. how does this season salvageable? The best way that I could see realistically is them finishing with three wins beating Saint Francis, Central State, and Wagner. So again, all right. I mean, that's. I think that's fair. Uh, um, that's a game below where I had them at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Um. I I picked them at four wins. I think I said that they're they were gonna win that Bryant game. Could have almost, but um, yeah. I think that's best case scenario for them. So you mentioned Central State, and that actually flows perfectly into our next segment, guys. We're going back. It's our weekly truth or lies. So, the first one, Mister Shuley, for these truth or lies. I can't wait to get to the second one because I know how big of a Tim Vecchio fan you are, but you have to wait for that. Um, the first one is, truth or lies, this matchup against Division Two 
Central State is a guaranteed win for Robert Morris. Truth or lies? Yes, you first. I'll, I'll I'm going to say a lie because nothing is guaranteed. Dang, that's what I was going to say. That's actually got to be quicker than right, that. Essentially but guaranteed. If they lose this game, this isn't just a game where, like, oh, uh, well, lost to a conference opponent. Oh, lost to a good team. This is a game where it's this like, bad what are we doing schools. here? You know, unless, granted, I'm a big, I think weather plays a huge factor in football. If they, if Central State rolls up here Saturday and it's ugly, it's nasty, it's cold. Kind of like it was against Virginia State. Kind of like it was against Virginia State. And Virginia State's going to stack the box and try to stop the run. And RMU's going to try to stop the run. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. If they lose this game, I think there's serious... There's some serious, serious problems. Here. So, so then do you Across say this the game board. is again as this game? This is, game is a must win. Yeah, this but is, is it a guarantee? Fact. But can do you think Robert Morris, without a doubt, can win this game? Oh, without a doubt, they can win this game. Without a doubt, they should win this game. Without a doubt, but that will they win that game? They will I'm like win this game. I'm like 85 percent confident and like. So that that's a, that's I'm, a pretty I'm, solid I'm, guarantee. Yeah. If, so I'm I'm on, I'm if I'm putting put put money on the game, I'm taking RMU. But but at the same time, would I be that RMU. surprised if Central State no. gets upset? If they, would if I, they, or if upsets they, RMU? No. Like You're saying it's not guaranteed. It's it's not guaranteed. No. Okay. I, I close to a guarantee. But but, I, I, but is I it close a to a guarantee if you're saying you won't be surprised if Robert Morris no, loses? No, because I have this. I just have this bad feeling There's in my gut. Well, gotta, then then and in I got I got I got a. Well, I, I said I said it. I said it's not like, yeah, give me what's Robert the, Morris has a what percent chance of winning? I said eighty five. I know this is truth or lies, but I want your number. I'm gonna I want I'm gonna make you make a decision on this because you haven't given me a clear statement in this entire segment so I'm far. Very flip floppy about this. Yeah. What do you mean? The part about mean. Because you're like, they're guaranteed, like, well, but they're not it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed, but it's not guaranteed. But so give me a percent. Time, Robert Morris has a 1% I'm, I'm, I'm chance to win this 80% game. I'm percent chance. So I'm going to say that's not guaranteed. Because like guaranteed no. to me would be no. like 90% and above. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Where are you floating? I, I said 85. I'm say 85%? Yeah, it's, it's, like, right. it's just like there's confidence there, and there should be. And it, you should go out there and beat the brakes off this team. But at the same time... It's Robert Morris football, and we don't know what we're going to get week in and week out. Yeah. All right. Next truth or lies. Oh, boy. And I'm going to start with you because I'm going to make him go last for this. Right. Well, so you Tim never Vecchio. get your answer to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, what's your answer? To this? Yeah. Yes, it's guaranteed. They'll Ooh. win without a doubt. So I don't care. Like it, they can win by one point, but I'm 100% Robert Morris is going to win this. All right, buddy. So truth or lies, Luke Yost, you're opening us up. Now, Tim Vecchio. All right. Technically, the, the second leading receiver on this team. The offensive yes. MVP the past two seasons. Two receptions for three yards against Bryant, uh, or not against Bryant, against Duquesne, rather. Um, in the opening game against Dayton, a lot of his yardage came in sort of garbage time situations. They were already down. That's when he caught a touchdown. He's kind of played second and third fiddle to guys like Gonzalez and Del, Del Femini. Is Tim Vecchio an overrated wide receiver? I wouldn't say overrated. I would just say... Uh, maybe like underappreciated in what he can do. Oh, uh, that's something like underutilized. Uh, underutilized perhaps. would be a better word, um, because like he's not a speed guy on the outside. He's not gonna burn anybody deep. He's he's a small guy. He's not gonna be able to you know get up and get the ball. But you if you put him in the slot and let him run little slant routes, let him do it like a Julian Edelman or a. Uh, Amendola. Amendola. I, I'm, miss, I'm missing it. Wes Welker, even. Greatest slot receiver of all time. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, Tim Vecchio is. No, we won't. Is, yeah, we probably won't. <laughs> is that. He's like he's the the quintessential, like, little dude who can just, like, kind of sneak in a defense, find a little soft spot, hit him for 10 yards. At, like, that doesn't have to be anything big. You don't have to, like. You know, Tim Vecchio is not going to catch the ball, break three tackles, and take it to the house. He's going to catch the ball, give you, you know, an 8 to 12 yard range, and then just keep the thing, like, just keep the ball moving. That's how, that's what I think. All right, Mike Shirley, what do you I got? I think my favorite thing that you said there was catch it for 10 yards and then that's it. Because he averages 10 yards a catch, 10.7. Average you. Oh averaged man. 10 yards a catch last year. Led the team in receiving last year with 300, and, what is it? 321 Only 300 yards, yards. 321 yards and two Yikes. touchdowns with a long of 41. And averaged 29.2 a game. So, actually, this year he's averaging more per game 
at 32 yards per game than he was last year. But as for the question, is he overrated or underrated, I think he's rated where he should be. He's one of the better receivers on the team. I said last week I think Anthony Delfemini might be a better receiver than him. Delfemini's the best pure wide receiver, yeah. Best pure wide receiver on that team. Do I think he's better than Delano Madison? Yes. Yes. Do I think he's better than McGee? Yes. Best receiver on that team, best pass catcher on that team is Matthew Gonzalez, by far. I don't think that's undisputable. But to say that he's underrated, no, he was the team offensive MVP the last two seasons. But to say that he was overrated, the numbers support that from the previous two seasons. The numbers support that he should have been the offensive MVP because the run game didn't do anything. They did, didn't do much in the passing game. But like you could probably could have put an asterisk next to that because his numbers were not very good last year for an offensive MVP because the offense well, was just so... nobody else. Like, yeah, was it was deal. just so bad. So, yeah, he becomes that guy that kind of luck of the draw. He wins the award because, well, at least someone did yeah. something, you know. But I don't think he's overrated from the sense that... I, I, I don't even think he's first or second option, maybe not even the third option, you know, uh, in the passing game, so... For two, he's had a few of these real clunker games where he has like three, like 10 yards or something like that. I'm going to say he did the same thing against like James Madison or something. Yeah, he might grab a touchdown in garbage time, but it still counts on the stat sheet. You know, he still caught it. Well, <laughs> it doesn't, the value doesn't quite hold. No, the value doesn't quite hold, but he had that touchdown versus CCSU on the reverse. He had that on that handoff there. So. I, I don't want to say he's overrated or underrated. I think he's properly rated as one of the better pass catchers on the team, but not the best. So I'm going to disagree with both of you. I think he's incredibly overrated, and here's why. Timmy Vecchio was the offensive MVP, and I think the, the perception was is that if he had a better quarterback, if he had a better offensive line, if he had a better offensive coordinator, that Timmy Vecchio was going to be a lot better. I think you guys can agree with me on that. Going into the season, there was expectations of Timmy Vecchio. Again, he is a quarterback. He can hit him in the slot. He's great. Well, Tim Vecchio can't break a tackle. As soon as you get Tim Vecchio, someone grabs him, he's going to go down. He's, he's too small. He gets bullied on the inside because he's so small. And I know you said Julian Edelman, Wes Welker type guy. But if you really have the skill sets of a Wes Welker, Julian Edelman type guy, you're not coming to Robert Morris because there are certain intangibles that you carry that make you good enough to play on a bigger Division One school. With Tim Vecchio, and I know you're waiting to say Actually, something. Actually, Edelman went D2. So. Well, Edelman oh. didn't go D2. Did he? No, he played Kent State. Yeah, he played. Yeah, he that was, was that was, was a bigger decent. division one. I don't know who you're thinking of, yeah, but one my one. point is, is that you see how yeah. overrated Tim Vecchio is when he's putting up the exact same numbers in a significantly better offense, a top thirty offense overall in a lot of categories. That is why Tim Vecchio is overrated. I just, I I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm just saying who's better than him. Uh, and th- that's not that's who, not the point. My point isn't who's better. My point is the fact that. People value him a lot but higher because he's on a team. All right, with not so a lot the of people that value receivers. him are a lot higher are the media, correct? Huh? Well, people we're the, value we're him a lot media. higher are everyone in general in terms of like the fan base, the way that the perception of Timmy Vecchio was that he was the best wide receiver on that team because he was the offensive he's MVP, the only wide because he put up numbers, because yeah, he was but great coming in the into this season that. He was the only wide receiver on that team, really. And exactly, and that's why he's and overrated. That's my whole point. See, I don't think that means that he's overrated. Now that you have other people stepping up, you have better people on the roster. Exactly, so you realize that he wasn't as valued as he should be. He was valued higher because there was nobody else, and he should never have I been valued that high. I still think he's an above-average player on that team. I'm I, not saying he's a I'd argue he's an average player on that team. I mean, he's better, I, than, I he's better than every other option except one player as a pure wide receiver, in my eyes. To me... I disagree because, again, the only time he's ever really getting big yards is late in games. I mean, that's not necessarily and true. That's one Dayton game. No, that's that's pretty much every game. When has he ever been the leading receiver on this team in the season? He hasn't. And there's been games where Del Femini wasn't right. – I mean, Del Femini wasn't significant in the lineup until the Bryant game, which was only, what, three weeks ago? I mean, Timmy Vecchio didn't do anything against Virginia State. He didn't record a catch against Virginia State in the team's one win. You can't consider him a valuable player if in the team's one win, he didn't even make the stat sheet. Hold on, hold on. They did, they hardly passed the ball in that Virginia State game. It doesn't matter. It, it, I mean, then, then if your he's point, if he's your, your most if he's receiver, your most valuable as asset receiver. and you're not getting him the ball, then clearly well, he's overrated. Well, hold on. He's the most valuable asset on last year's team and the year before, where they were garbage. You know, I don't think you well, look at the team and you, s- out and said they you were look at the team. Wow. Well, they were garbage. They were. They were. I garbage. know. But not, wow, not, that not, was not trying to sugarcoat things. The offense was garbage. 
you know. But, no, but that's not my point. Say, that's not my point. My I point is the fact that he was overvalued because he was the best on a bad tag, team. They put this tag of offense. So do you think Timmy Vecchio is a good receiver? Yes or no? For this Robert Morris football team? No, in general, is he a good receiver? For the NEC? Yes. I'd have to check the stats, but I'd probably say he's probably below average. But what, exactly. Hold that's on, my hold point. on, hold on. But here's the thing, though. Gonzalez and Delfemini, and by the way, Vecchio, I still believe, is second in the team in receiving yards. And that's whether fine. Whether it's garbage numbers or not, but here's the thing. And that's for, what I'm for, saying. For, so most of those are NFL garbage perspective, yards. For an NFL perspective, that's like saying— We're not Frank, talking NFL, yeah, though. But you're like saying—that's like, hold on. Frank Gore, all right? What are your opinions on Frank Gore? One of the all-time leading rushers. I believe he's top 10. Never really played on a great team. You can say a lot of his yards are garbage time, but guess what? He still has the stats. No, that's not what I'm saying because Tim Vecchio, even on those bad teams, never is, put up significant but numbers. Is, is that Frank Gore did put up significant, put up significant when you numbers. Put, when but you that's my point is that it were valued higher because of the lack of talent around him, yeah, but, that's, but he that's, didn't but improve with if the improvement at, of talent. If you look at that title of offensive MVP from those two For seasons, you have to years. put an asterisk on it because and that's no, one, no one was but valuable. That's what I'm saying, and that's why he's overrated. That's 100% my argument. Okay. You guys are agreeing yeah. with me saying, I'm not in every that, sense well, of the word. I'm not saying that he's You just over, don't want to throw in the rated, word overrated. I, no, I think he's rated properly. I don't think he's rated properly. The, the point is, and we're never we're not going to agree on this, and that's fine because we're going to move on. Well, you're um, wrong. And that's fine, Shh, Logan Carney. Um, but, yeah, so we're, we're actually out of time. But uh, before we oh, do man. this. We made um, it halfway through the rundown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I That's just want your guys' predictions. Talk We've about talked about Central State enough to oh, yeah, kind of get that thought. So, again, whether it was a guaranteed win or not. Luke Yost, Robin Moore Central State. Yikes, I was way off last give me a Give me a score and who's going to win. Oh, boy. Um. All right, I got it. It's not rocket science. Hurry up. Yeah, okay. Uh, wow. We got, we got 28-13 Robin Moore's. Okay. Defense is going to show up. Ho- I said they were going to do it last week. That didn't happen. <laughs> nope. Oh, he's, he's pulling oh, off no, the no, Now i gotta, now I got to rethink my uh, position. Oh, is that close? Because you, no, because you said it, oh, the def- you think the defense is going to show up. I was originally going to say 45-10. Yikes. But we're going to up. We're gonna help Virginia State out here. We're going to say – It's Central State. Or Central State, sorry. I was looking at the roster. Different D2 Virginia team. It's State. fine. Um, they might lose to. <laughs> they all, they should have lost to. <laughs> I'm gonna say 45 for the Colonials and 28 for Central State. Uh, no, not even no. 17. We'll give them 17 points. Right, 45. See, he 17. hit exactly what I was gonna say. 45. 28. I I do. I think that what's gonna happen is one one of those is gonna be a garbage time touchdown by Central State. Where Robert Morris is going to be up. How many? How many garbage time touchdowns does Timmy Vecchio score? Uh, Timmy Vecchio is not going to score a touchdown, and it's going to just support my he's conclusion have, that he's he, overrated. Tim Vecchio is going to have four catches for like thirty-eight yards. <laughs> I guess we'll have to see, but yeah, no, I um, I'm going to stand by that, and uh, we're just going to have to see. So forty, forty-four or forty-five to twenty-eight. Yes. Now that would be their um, Virginia State's or Virginia State, Jesus, Central State's second highest point total of the season. Yeah. Wow. That's how bad so the Robert t- defense so is. You're I have telling no confidence me in them. You g- they've given me no reason to be confident, Mike. <laughs> True. So you're telling me that uh, p- Clark p- Atlanta University, <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky State University, <laughs> or not Kentucky, yeah. Kentucky no, not State. Kentucky State. Benedict, Benedict College. <laughs> Miles College. Elizabeth City State <laughs> University. <laughs> <laughs> all yes. have better defenses yes. Yes. than the and, no yes. Kentucky State too. All yes. have better defenses. Than, wow. Yes. So someone's confident in this defense. <sighs> yeah, lack lack of confidence. Yeah, I think I think I'm pro. They're still they're still gonna put up yards though. I just don't think they're gonna punch it in the end zone. I have a, I have a feeling that they're gonna get inside the twenty yard line and not have a kicker <laughs> like Virginia State did, and then just not be able. But that's to how convert. they're gonna end up See, scoring. Virginia, is the fact. I think they're gonna kicker, be able to convert. More, so, so, but guys, we're gonna have to see. This is all the time we have left. Unfortunately. We've, we've gone over, definitely. But it's a web show, so we can really do whatever we want. Ah. I'm trying to go home. Break so I have a midterm that I... I got an article to write that's... Yeah, I have to study hour. for... Yeah, so thank you so uh, much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Bobby Moore Football Show. I'm Sam Anthony. Um, joining me is... Mike, I think Tim Vecchio is the best wide receiver ever. That Surely. is not true. I literally <laughs> said that he's not the best receiver on this I team. Know. I literally said I just that he's, see, see how on easy this that team, is? he's not even this close PT to the best receiver. And Luke Yost is That's with me. That's not true at all. Thank <laughs> you so much for tuning in. And uh, please catch us next week. We're going to be on armyswitchmedia.com, uh, armyTV on YouTube. This is ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, so thank you so much this for tuning ridiculous. in. See you next week. Peace out.